The first comment I was going to make is that uh, I have this little motto that I go by in life and uh, that's that I seek perfection but I understand reality and uh, what you've seen today and involved in is uh, a whole lot of reality and uh, that's the case with this stop here. I came out here on, on Sunday just before the All Blacks were kicking off and uh, sat on this face and it was gale nor'west, absolutely ripping through here and I looked at the forecast and uh, it said it's going to be nor'west this time Friday and I thought perfect but uh, we seem to have a, a light nor'east coming through and uh, it's just wafting through but anyway hopefully you can hear us. Uh, when I say that about the reality as you know as farmers things uh, doesn't matter how well we plan things and that stuff happens and there's some things I wanted to highlight uh, that a few of you pointed out you know on the journey around like the whorehound in the paddock the loosened paddock we drove through with the sheep in it you know that's that's a part of the game but it's making sure that we build the systems and it's like the loosen it doesn't look as good as it did two weeks ago we had 28 degrees here 12 days ago 26 the next day go northwest the aphids decided that plant was under attack and stress so it came in we sprayed the stuff to get rid of them and for some reason it's uh, just checked it so our loosen looks a bit average driving around um, but you know that that's the thing I wanted to point out uh, hopefully you've seen signs of a business though that's focused on continuous improvement and also you've witnessed some animals being given the opportunity through management and fit nutrition to reach their genetic potential. Um, we're all about taking the opportunities that the season allows and so right now you know this season uh, we're not sure where it's going to go but our soil moisture meters are telling us um, that uh, we might be in a bit of trouble shortly so we're not heavily stocked um, and we're making sure we can look after the animals but also look after that land resource heading into the summer. Does anyone have any questions on, on what you saw going around? Those balls have got uh, rumensin bloat capsules in them. That's a practice we'd love to get away from, but at the moment we need to do it to have them on the loosen to grow the quantity of beef that we can. So we get a deduction for that product uh, at the meat company of 10 cents a kilo. But those boys, the tops of them are heading out next week. Uh, the top animals in there are between 760 and 780 kilos at the moment. So again, that's what I said about trying to make the most of that genetic potential. How, how do we get on with bloat? It's a big issue with loosen. So I asked Eric if he could uh, do some study on this a few years ago and uh, he said it'd be too hard to find the funding because it's such a big topic. I used to say we had no trouble, so we use rumens and bloat capsules, put those in, guaranteed 100 days, no trouble. A few years ago we had animals still blowing up with those in them. Um, the last few years hadn't been too bad. So far this season, apart from the first week, we had a couple blow up, didn't die or anything, but uh, blow up, we've been all right. A lot of guys I work with in Canterbury won't put bulls on loosen anymore or cattle on loosen. So there's a whole lot of stuff we don't know. Um, we're continuing to learn and grow in that space, so can't fully answer that one. Sorry, Tim. Any other questions just on that, or we'll jump through to the next bit? What percentage of the farm is in pure loosen? So at the moment we've got the smallest percentage in pure loosen that we've had for a long time. We sold off quite a bit of that uh, to my sister and brother-in-law in the summer because uh, it was a good family succession move. Not probably the best business move, but you know, uh, you've got to look at the big picture. Um, and we bought another place which had nothing on it and so we're, we're working to that at the moment. So pure loosen right now, um, We've got about 150 hectares out of uh, two and a half thousand. So that's that's the least we've had for a while, but we've got about that area in loosened grass pastures as well, like this one we're in here, which is plantain, prairie grass and loosen. Where do we want to get to with loosen? Maybe not a target, it's more what the, what the land lets us. So you know, I'll probably talk about that in the cropping too, but anywhere we can grow loosen, we will. It has a couple of years out and then comes back in. Uh, the wetter stuff goes into the fescues over there, but we'll talk about that a bit later, thanks. Now, systems is a really important thing for us here at Bonnevere. And um, Barry mentioned earlier about the why. Uh, so, so what we came up with there was leading the farming industry through demonstrating and perfecting the vision defined for the property. 
and that vision for the property is efficient conversion of sunlight and water into products that consumers value highly with lower carbon, higher biodiversity, happy animals and passionate people. Now one of the, the really important things about uh, building systems I think is, is doing a SWOT analysis and really understanding what the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats are and then developing those systems around that. And for us, we came up with this thing many years ago uh, with the help of Graham Ogle called the three R's and they are the three key times of the year. So we have the risk period which runs from about Christmas or mid-December through to mid-February. Really high probability during that time that we're not going to grow a whole lot of dry matter. It's a pretty hard time to, uh, to farm animals and, and grow pasture and grass mare. So a really good time to be lightly stocked, have a holiday and get ready for the, the season ahead. Mid-February we roll into the recovery period, the second of the R's. And the recovery period runs from mid-Feb through to about August. And the recovery period's all about preparing for the year ahead. So that's when we try and uh, focus on growing as much dry matter as we can and then we work out which animals we're going to bring in to make the most of that dry matter. From sort of August through to Christmas, mid-December, is the third of the hours, the revenue period, and that's the most fun one, and that's what we're in at the moment. So the key things at this time of the year are about animals growing as fast as they can so they leave the property before we hit the risk period. So, uh, as I said, it's all about live weight gain, growing fast during this, um, this time of the year and those animals luckily for us coincide with higher schedules so they leave the property and, uh, and we head back into that risk period. So to answer your question Sam, we moved from being uh, quite a high component of capital stock and, and not a lot of opportunity to now being 50-50 roughly in a, in a good season capital stock to what we call opportunity stock and we're about 50-50 sheep to cattle ratio. And that might vary a, li a little bit from year to year, but that's roughly where we sit. The last couple of years I've been thinking about ways that we could run less, but still be profitable. And it's quite funny because uh, now we're kind of all faced with that with some of the legislation that's coming at us. And to be honest, it's actually really hard. Um, Every year when we start out and I make the budget, the easiest way to make it look better is to trade some more animals. And so we've been working in this space for a while. We don't have the answers, but we're committed to continue to learn and grow in that area because we see it as a way to move forward. And I think another big part of, of building the systems and, and learning and growing um, is learning from our challenges and our, our failings, the things that haven't worked that we've tried. Um, that's where the greatest learning ha happens, as my father said early, when, when you're down in the valleys. So, you know, the, the earthquakes, the droughts, all those things. Um, it's learning from those things and building the systems to be more resilient. Quarter of the farm can grow loose in Dick's saying, what, what is the ambitions for the other three quarters? I guess we're going to talk about some of that shortly. Uh, with some of the things we're doing on the hills behind here. Um, but a lot of that north facing stuff is about managing it environmentally. It's a uh, country that uh, is generally not that desirable to own, uh, but it's a big part of our business. About 30% of it is, is that sort of country, which uh, even in a good year doesn't produce a whole heap and has a lot of challenges with it. Um, the hill country, the shadier stuff, there's, there's opportunities for us to do better there, so big focus is always on um, subdivision and grazing management first, but whenever we buy a new property, we tell the bank manager that we're going to hook in from day one, put the third on, get the pastures and everything going at the same time. We've learnt that model works best, and so um, yeah, it's, it's fencing, water, subdivision and, and fertiliser, um, and then where we can um, change the pastures we do. Are we going to cover off some of our sheep policy now or later on? When we won this competition, I made a comment um, at the awards evening that we'd put on a field day that would be different. Not just because I'm a redhead, but uh, because we do look at things different to mainstream. 
And so you'll notice there's a deliberate order in which we're going through things here this afternoon and the, the plants and the animals we'll talk about last um, because the next couple of sections I go into Ali had in the handout Fraser's Golden Nuggets well if you want to get some takeaway things from today the stuff we're about to go into is probably the golden eggs and that'd be the stuff to write some notes down you've probably picked up on it already but people and, and mindsets really big stuff it, it, it's huge that's what drives drives me and in, in this operation and uh, one of the things uh, I was thinking about it the other day I uh, I've coached quite a bit of sport played a lot of sport and one of the things I've learnt in doing all of that is that generally the game is won or lost before we actually hit the field the court whatever we're going on to it's about having ourselves in the right headspace having communicated the plan with our team and so everyone knows where we're going and so when things don't work out or whatever we all know what's happening and we're not tearing around under pressure in the heat of the battle making those wrong decisions and so for me that's why this stuff is so important and it starts with passion you know we talked about Derek Nigel jumped up with passion passion's everything for me life's short so get involved in stuff you're passionate about and, and work with those that are passionate about what they do. Where you can choose to build relationships with passionate people, it's far more exciting. Occasionally we have to do business with people that aren't passionate about what they do, and it's not much fun. Communication, communication, communication. Did I mention communication? It is the most important thing and everyone gets sick of me saying it. I can see the guys laughing up the back because I talk about it all the time. But whether it's our personal relationships at home, whether it's our workplace stuff, it's on the sporting field, if we communicate the plans, communicate the issues and that side of thing from both sides, we're far more likely to end up in the, the place that we want to be. And so it's really important. The back of good communication, we build sound, strong, meaningful relationships. And relationships kind of is what I spend most of my time doing here at Bonavarie, building great relationships. And I mentioned it at the start of the day, we're incredibly grateful for all of you here that have, have joined us and, and built those strong relationships to help us get where we are. Surround yourself with others. And that's something I'm really big on, and that's why I thanked all of you at the start of the day, because that's how we learn and grow. And when we were watching you going around the farm, there's all these vehicles not full and I'm like gee those people have missed an opportunity to learn and grow because I told you all at the start of the day that you're all special you've all got a great story and you're all here and yet some of you cho chose to drive around on your own just two or three of you you know take those opportunities every chance I get I engage with more people and learn and grow and make those people feel valued so that they want to be with you and on your team. Ask the right questions. What's the value? What am I going to get out of it? Not what does it cost? Grow a hunger for learning and growth. That's a, a big focus of ours we've talked about already. And remember that farming's complex now. It's way more complex than it used to be and it's going to go more that way and we love the fact the challenge of every season being different because it makes us learn and grow more and it's okay to say that I don't know and this is the part where all the wives that have come on the thing whack their husbands in the ribs because us rural men don't like to admit we don't know something but the idea of surrounding yourself and people as I said, it's so complex, there's so much we have to know. None of us are capable of knowing it all. And even using Google or Siri or whoever you're into, you know, surround yourself with people. Know where you can go to get the answer, but be happy to accept you don't know the answer. The biggest part of having a team and the best part is when all that team contributes. And so that's a real focus for us. If everyone's adding to it, then that's a really strong team. 
and celebrate your wins. Sometimes it's tough and the wins might only be small and so celebrate them even bigger than you have before. But take that time to celebrate the stuff you're doing well. And there's something that uh, I learned a few years ago, so uh, about five years ago I dislocated my shoulder and, uh, and then I did it another couple of times and so I had to have shoulder reconstruction and I couldn't play hockey for three years. And last year I got back on the hockey field and um, I suddenly realised the importance of what I call me time. And me time is one of those things that's really easy to cancel because you're only letting yourself down but it's the most important thing for all of us to be involved in. And so when I go off to hockey, I play with a whole lot of random people, including Heath from Vet Marlborough here. He's way quicker and better than I am, but I sweat and puff and pant along and, and try and keep up. And then we have a beer afterwards, and it's something that I do for myself. I go out and do that every week because it's, you know, trainings at this time, the games at that time, and I make it happen. It might be going to the pub and having a beer or a coffee with a friend or something. Could be going for a walk. But make sure you prioritise it. Because for me, I've learnt that it's the most important time. And remember, shit happens. Doesn't matter how well we plan, things go wrong. Sometimes really big. Sometimes just little things. What's important, I believe, is how we deal with that stuff. So we've uh, been focused on a whole lot of this stuff for quite a while and recently uh, I got the opportunity to learn and grow more by attending Yana Hawkins' Lean Dairy Farm Day because a whole lot of local people decided they were too busy working to go so I said well should I'll go, take that opportunity. And that was one of the best off-farm days I've had in a long, long time because for me it was positive affirmation that a whole lot of the thinking I had someone was doing out there at a better level than what we are and it gave us some tools and ideas to dot the I's and cross the T's. So at the start of the day I said to you, we're excited about where we're at, but we're more excited about where we're going. That's one of the tools that we're excited about. With continuous improvement we're always seeking to be better and so there's a whole lot of that stuff and, and we're yeah, building systems all the time and getting work, working on but it, it's really big for me. You know, as I said before, if they understand what we're trying to achieve, we're far more likely to achieve it because they can tell me what the issues they see from their angle and why we can't get that. Um, so, yeah, no, really you know, transparent and open with that. You also talked about continuous improvement training. Can you give us some specifics around the training that you provide uh, with the staff and I think earlier in the day you mentioned that um, in your weekly meetings you talk about what learning uh, are the staff or, or you going to undertake and you build your week around that. Can you give us some examples of that please? Yeah, so, so learning's been important for us for years. Um, we, we, as I say, we, we prioritise it at the start of the week. Uh, beef and lamb events, you know, we make it so the whole team can go if they want to. Um, th those type of things. We support the ITO program, anything you know that, that someone in the team wants to learn. But back in, I think it was March, we had a, a, a team meeting. I said to the team, you know, I, th I think we've been doing some great stuff in this space, but I'd like to be better. And so I want to have the discipline that every fortnight we make sure we have learning. And their initial response was, I think that's a bit often, Fraser, you know, it might be a bit keen. And I said, well, you know, let's set the bar high and if we don't make it the odd time, well, that's okay. Since then, we've missed two fortnights. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, those can be events like beef and lamb events. Sometimes it'll be a skill that one of the team members has got they want to talk about. Sometimes I'll talk through something. Um, we might have someone come in. Graham Payne spoke earlier. You know, he's been in and and sat down with the team, talked through stuff. We might go away, do something else. Um, so it's, it's something that we prioritise, you know, that way it, it makes it happen. But th the biggest thing I can say is, is make decisions. So uh, the, the worst thing that I often see is when we fail to make decisions, 
we get the deer in the headlights type thing and, uh, and we don't do anything. Um, and one of the things I've learned over the years, the easiest way to uh, position yourself to be able to make those decisions is to create options and flexibility in your systems through everything. And so I always have in my mind options that are there um, should something arise. So that way when things do occur, we don't feel pressured. So right now we know that if it doesn't rain in the next bit of time, what the first animals will be to leave, we've got those things and we're not, it's not going to be a hard decision to make. Um, so it's creating those options, even in simple things like sock rotations and stuff like that. If you can create more options, uh, it just makes that decision making process easier. And so have that flexibility as well, even in just the, the most basic farm tasks. The more options and flexibility, the easier I've found it to make those decisions. A big part of making those decisions is understanding where you are. And so if you know where you're at, because you've measured and monitored it, then it's a whole lot easier to work out, well, where do we want to be and build that path to get there and make those decisions. And we all have what I call gut feel. And so when I came home, I had a gut feel about, you know, how much feed and the quality of it was in a paddock and looking at the animals, how fast they were growing. And what I learned that by getting involved in tools and technology, it took my gut feel to a whole nother level. And so when we're bringing animals into the yards or something like that, we hardly ever get surprises because of the measuring and monitoring, but that level that it's taken also the gut feel. So in a way, some of that stuff we've relaxed a bit because we're farming with a whole higher level of gut feel than what we used to. And so I mentioned the tools. It's, it's about having the tools, uh, but it's also having the people the people around you to help make those decisions um, and help you understand where you're at. And timing is everything. Timing of decision making is huge. S someone made the call earlier, um, might have been lucky, about uh, Brian Hocken, four hours difference. You know, like four hours doesn't seem like much, but on some days in the year, four hours between getting on the phone and ringing a stock agent can be a huge amount of money. So it's making those decisions uh, in the right time. And as I said, make decisions. That's the most important thing. And once you make it, don't look back. Just look forward. It may not turn out to be the right decision, but don't think about that. Move forward, you've made the decision, and look for the next opportunity. I've always uh, been a big fan of, of computer programs and things. Uh, I mentioned this morning about the, uh, the Tinder for JD. I, I've never tried that one, but uh, mo most of the, the farming programs that are out there I've, I've been on at some stage. Um, and so I just I wanted to share what we currently use. Um, I don't suggest that you get involved in all of them if you're not you know, using some at the moment, but for us they all have their place and they help to make those decisions and make us understand where we're at and help with where we want to go. And so for financial stuff, we're using Zero and Figured. Um, we find that that works really well. Um, farm IQ is a live farm diary for us. So everything that happens on farm goes in. Everyone on the team has to, uh, to import what they're up to. Okay, so we wouldn't employ someone now if they weren't prepared to do that, it's a really important thing for us. Uh, when we do farm assurance audits, it's pretty well pull out the farm IQ plus a couple of other things. Uh, there's so much stuff that we can do in that program. Farm X, it's all about the, the planning, where we're going forward and, uh, and looking at the opportunities. So we talked about 50% opportunity stock. We run that all through Farm X. Look at uh, if we purchase some bulls, how that looks on our feed supply, financially what it's going to do, and, uh, and then obviously think about the management implications as well. Greg's been working with us for the last 12 months on, on a new product he's working on called Farm Insight Dashboard. And so in the handout you'll see one page of that. I think uh, the report he sends me every month is, is about 10 pages, but that's sort of the, the dashboard uh, front page. 
Uh, so that pulls information out of all three of uh, those first programs, the, the zero figured Farm IQ and Farm X, and puts it there on one great page. And so Barry's been on at me for years that I had to pull up all this stuff and I was chipping away, taking forever to put something together. And Greg came along and said, I've got this idea. And I said, Chip, that's fantastic. That's going to save me a whole lot of work. And so really excited about uh, what that's doing. Um, in terms of us quite quickly seeing where we're at with different uh, KPIs, but also for that reporting to the board and uh, bank manager and whoever else uh, we want to report to. The other technology we've got involved with in the last few years is with Harvest. And so we have uh, on-farm water pump and, and uh, water tank control stuff so we can see uh, at any stage if we've got issues with our water system We've got monitors on our electric fence line, so that comes up on, on the phones. So I, if mine was in my pocket, I could tell you what uh, power was running through that fence just behind us there. So, you know, we don't have to go out the back uh, every day to, to check the power to make sure the bulls are behaving, that sort of thing. Uh, that's been great. Um, the recent addition, back in February, we installed two climate stations on the property. So as we come out of this place and go back onto Grassmere Road, some of you uh, would have noticed coming up the road, climate station uh, just off the road and at the edge of a loosened paddock there. So that's one of them. That measures rainfall, wind speed and direction, soil temperature and moisture at 10, 30 and 60 centimetres for the loosen. And so the, the thinking is there that in a few years time all of our different land management units we will have one of those stations and so we can get that little edge to work with that gut feel stuff to make those decisions four hours earlier again because as I said that stuff adds up quick you might find in a few years time I've got a whole lot of cheap uh, weather stations for sale but uh, at this point we think it's something that's going to be really good for us to take a step forward and also believe it could be good for some compliance stuff uh, down the track as well um, all flex so there's some team from Allflex here today. Uh, we're big on EID tags. So all of our um, breeding ewes are EID tagged and all our replacement ewe lambs get an EID tag at tailing time. And so we can track them through. That's technology that I think we're going to use a lot more going forward. We actually uh, stopped using it for a couple of years because we thought we weren't doing enough with it. And the usual story, we, we spent quite a long time making that decision and then we decided no we won't and I knew when we made that decision we'd regret it and a couple of years ago Pete Anderson who talked about the stock care stuff at the hall came along and said Fraser I've got another idea why your hoggets aren't performing that well we have a, a terrible problem with abortion in our hoggets and, um, and anyway so we worked through this thing but we needed EID tags and everything and I said bugger I knew that was going to happen one day so we're, we're back doing that all again um, and think there's some opportunities uh, in that space going forward. We've invested in uh, race wool um, sheep handlers, so we've got a, a six-way auto drafter here at home and a, a three-way down on the Glenfield block. All those things uh, just make things easier, better. You know, when we get the lambs in at weaning time, every lamb is weighed. All the works lambs, the replacements, that sort of thing. It's not hard when you've got the right gear. And so the tech thing's huge. When I first came home, Dad and I would go to weigh the, the sheep and we had uh, this old weigh crate, I'm not sure what type it was, and had be on the, uh, on the weigh crate and I'd be keeping the sheep up. And about every second sheep he banged his elbow on this big bolt that stuck out the top of it and he'd be cursing and I'd be like, no, this is not working, we'll just guess the weight today and move on and then we'd get to... Uh, to scanning time and we'd be absolutely gutted because the ewes had only scanned 135% and we thought we'd fed them well. But we weren't measuring. You know, we thought we were feeding them right. We weren't measuring what we were feeding them. We had no idea what weight they were pre-mating, mating or post-mating. And so all that stuff just helps create that picture so that then we can repeat results. Because that's what we're all about here, trying to repeat results year after year, regardless of the weather. The only difference is in some of the tougher seasons, we don't take as, have as many opportunities we can get involved in. The infrastructure part. So years ago we thought, oh yeah, we had not bad infrastructure. 
But over the last few years, I realised that no, it wasn't good enough. And so we've been on a real mission in recent years and spent a lot of money trying to lift our, uh, our infrastructure and the team's done a really good job around that. Uh, one of the things you don't notice when you drive around a farm like this today is the fact that all the gates swing really nicely, got decent latches because, and we're not quite there, but it used to be that way that, you know, out the back paddock there's that latch that you have to shut that way when the bulls are in there or otherwise they'll get it open and get next door and there's that funny electric fence piece that has to be hooked up. And so we've tried to do away with all of that, but it costs a lot of money and it takes a, a bit of time as well. And so that's all stuff that we've, we've worked really hard on in recent years to get to. The other thing, uh, I guess, just in that space with, with some of that uh, tech thinking and, and stuff is, uh, and I talked about farm assurance before. So we were the first farm the week before lockdown to be audited under the New Zealand Farm Assurance program plus pilot thing and uh, we haven't passed yet but uh, we're, we're getting close to getting to that point but I'm really excited about some of those sorts of things you know there's a lot of work um, but having technology and that side of things helps and it's about again telling that story having that stuff there that, so the consumer knows what's going on here on farm. We've got some trees behind us you want to tell us what these plantings are all about and what um I guess you alluded to it earlier on, um, the future farm may look like. I'm sure I'm not uh, doing that good a job of explaining our whole system, so there must be a whole lot of questions out there. I guess you're just saving them up for back at the hall later on, and they're all around Lucerne and animals, because they're the, the next two sections coming up. So if you've come here wanting to hear about that stuff, don't worry, it, it's still coming. I've been saying for um, oh, probably 12 months or so now um, that I believe every land holding in New Zealand has an opportunity to have more trees on it. Um, and that doesn't mean that I want to see beautiful farms planted out in pine trees, but I think there's an opportunity for the right tree in the right place to get a whole lot more of that. And that thinking comes from, again, that farm assurance stuff. So a few years ago, about six years ago, I was sitting down being audited and it was the only question I struggled with in the audit was, do you have shade and shelter in every paddock on the farm? And I said, no. And the guy said, yeah, you do, yeah, you know, you've got hills and you've got tussocks and you've got, you know, this and you've got that. And I said, yeah, but you said every paddock. And he said, oh, no, you do, you know, every, everyone does farms, New Zealand farms are beautiful places and they are. But I said, well, that's something I'm determined to fix. And so... Since that time, we've gone about trying to get a lot more trees on our farm. Our farm of the future will have at least a tree boundarying or in every paddock on this farm. And that, you know, it takes time and money again, so you need to be getting the other things right to be able to do that. But when I say every, every land holding has an opportunity to have more trees, it's these places like this in our operation so these hard north-facing hills, they don't grow much, even in a good year. And so we've decided we can take them out, plant them in trees, and uh, add value in other ways to the business without losing a whole lot of productive land. The tree loosened block here in the front, when that was first planted three years ago, the idea was it was a hay shed. So you will have seen a few of those as we've driven around the farm. And whenever we got into a dry time or something like that, we could put the stock in without having to go and feed them out, and they get a few days, a week, whatever, in that block, and then they go to the next, and all of a sudden we'd bought ourselves a month for a mob. And we did that with salt bushes as well. Um, and that was helping look after those faces. They're pretty erosion prone. But uh, they don't grow a lot in that sort of process. And uh, one thing the tree loosen does really well, systems thinking again, it flowers in the winter time. And so that provides feed for the bumblebees, which we need to pollinate loosen seed in the summertime that uh, we, we try and grow a little bit of. And so a couple of years ago, I got talking with a few guys, um, Adam Forbes, some of you may have uh, met, and um, got excited. Uh, we've been doing natives in, in wetland areas and 
little riparian areas and that on the farm for quite a few years. But we thought, well, what if we could establish native shrubland, maybe native forest on some of this country using the tree loosen as a nurse plant? Because it fixes nitrogen, it's a legume. And so this year, in this uh, block here, up through the middle, there's been some natives planted and they were measured just last week and the guys are really happy with how they're doing. And then the hill in the back, uh, that's seven and a half hectares. And uh, these guys said, oh, would you be interested in getting involved in a little uh, trial project? And uh, I said, yeah, no, that'd be fantastic if we get a little bit of help. So the strip going up with the, um, with the covers, the guards around some of them is part of the trial. And I said, well, we're gonna plant the rest of the hill out. Are you happy with that? And um, they said, yeah, no, that's great. And so we've planted the rest of the hill out. It's all in tree loosen and nyo and the nyo are going to be nurse plant um, as well, but then we've planted in amongst that uh, Aleria paniculatas, um, Halls totras, a few pittosporums, and there's even a few beaches up there. Um, and the idea is next year we're going to fill in more, and then a couple of years after we'll put in some more and just see when the best time is to add the, uh, the natives with using the nurse plant and so it's, it's a, yeah, looking at it, that hill didn't grow much and it's kind of like the office window, you know, it's going to look a whole lot nicer, add more value, this carbon stuff and, and that side of things, so that's the focus with that. 30% um, of our farms, that sort of country and so potentially here in the future we're going to have, you know, quite sizable blocks looking, uh, well, a whole lot better than that actually, you know, forest uh, shrubland over them and something, um, yeah, pretty excited about. Have we gone off using them as grazing blocks? Uh, not totally, but sort of, yeah. Uh, they don't grow a heap um, in, in our environment, but they grow a bit, um, so we'll probably keep doing that a little bit on some just for the time being, Derek, but um, yeah, more, more interested in, in seeing if we can use them as a nurse plant to, to establish something greater. Will we claim carbon credits on them? Still working through all that stuff. Um, it's interesting when you, when you do any of this stuff, you think you hear all these things and you can go and get funding here and you can get funding there, but when it actually comes to it, there's all these little clauses and stuff and it's actually just easier to get on and do it. Um, so the little part up there, there's, there is you know, a trial piece that was funded, but the rest of it we've just done, and then we're sort of working through uh, yeah, what system or, or whatever we're going to get into. But lots of organisations are good at telling you that they want to help. It's like I said about the relationship thing before. Get involved with the ones that are passionate and going to go places with you. There's lots of people out there that would like to be on your team, but your team's probably better off without them. We're not nervous about planting a poisonous plant with stock, so that's around the nyos. So we've had nyos on the farm for a while. Uh, they are frost tender, so we grow them up on those, uh, those hillsides. Um, I mean, it's a risk, but uh, yeah, I guess those sort of things. So when we first started the tree planting, we weren't doing it properly. If you're going to do anything we've learned over the years, do it properly. And so we were skimping on the fencing and that sort of thing, and we had a few you know, misfortunes. Not where animals died, but where you know, stock got in and damaged plants. So we make sure that the, yeah, the fences are up to scratch, um, and we do all those things properly. Same with planting the trees. Source them from a good, good nursery. Um, make sure your spot spray before you plant. Use fertiliser. Um, do the follow-up spraying, all those things. Huge difference to the success um, of the establishment that you have. Have we considered fine leaf, lace bark and prostrate kofi? Yes. So we, we grow uh, all sorts of those things and, and other bits and yeah, you know, we're, we're keen always looking you know, at what will grow uh, here and we work closely with Donna and Grant at Morgan's Road Nursery. Um, find they have great plants sourced locally 